All right, guys, welcome to chapter seven. <clears throat> I apologize if I sound like I am in a tunnel. I'm actually using a new uh, recording device for all of this, and the audio quality isn't great on it, but I figured you guys would rather have this lecture with bad audio than not have one at all. I should also note that I am recording this on July 2nd, 2015, which, of course, is the real anniversary date of this country, so happy birthday, America. Um, let's go ahead and dive into chapter seven and talk about our first president. This is what we're gonna be discussing in this chapter. So a couple of the major themes that we're gonna cover, we're gonna look at the growth of federal power. That's gonna be one of the major focal points of this entire class is gonna be how we go from a country with a small limited government under the Articles of Confederation to a huge powerful government that you guys all know and love today. Next, we're going to look at the presidency of George Washington. We're going to look at George Washington's farewell address. Once we get here, you're going to want to put a star next to this. This always shows up on the AP exam. It's super simple, but it's important to remember. After that, we will look at the presidency of John Adams, and then we will look at the Alien and Sedition Acts, what those were, what those meant, and maybe we'll be able to draw some connections to things that happened later on in U.S. history. So again, when we go over these chapters, um, it's really important, especially if you're listening to this later on in the school year or maybe right before the AP exam, try to see how the things I'm talking about connect to things that we discussed later or things we've already discussed in this class. That's one of the major things you have to do to do well on the AP exam. All right, let's dive into chapter seven. So an immediate problem that we have with the Constitution. Is that, well, we don't really have anyone in charge just yet. Like, we make this brand new government, but no one's really sure what this government's going to look like or how it's going to be. Immediately, the Federalists, the ones that wrote the Constitution, the ones that argued in favor of it, are going to assume power. Because, you know, if you don't support the Constitution, you're not going to be really involved in this process anyway. Obviously, it's going to be the Federalist. Um, I don't like to call them a political party, even though they are, because there's no opponent to them right now. They're, they just kind of exist. These are the people in charge. We have deemed to call them the Federalist, um, but that's not really an all-inclusive term. Anyway, moving on. George Washington is unanimously elected president, and because of our strange political system at this time period, John Adams, the guy that got the second most, uh, second most votes, is vice president. We're going to fix that uh, system a little bit later. In fact, you might see why we think it's important to fix that system by the end of this chapter. Um, Washington is the best choice for a, a president. He is a national hero, and he's someone that the public already knew and trusted even though he's not the best qualified for this job. He lacks a formal education. Um, he has very little political experience. Uh, he's not a great speaker, which isn't super necessary back at the time, but he does have one big thing going for him. He is sterile. Remember, we have just overthrown a monarchy. The last thing we wanna do is to establish a new monarchy. Well, if you have a president who is incapable of having children, we can't establish a monarchy. Just something to think about. The first capital of the United States is actually going to be set in New York City. It's just easier to handle that. Well, not New York City, but in the area of New York. Um, Washington immediately realizes that, you know, I'm a cool guy. I'm kind of tall, but I really don't know what I am doing as president. I mean, that's not to say that Washington's an idiot. He's not. But... There's a lot of expertise involved in being president. Washington doesn't know everything. So one of the first acts he does as president is establish what we call the president's cabinet. Every single president has made one of these. What are they? It's the group of people who are advisors to the president. So for example, uh, let's just say that the president uh, doesn't know a lot about education. He's going to have a secretary of education, and that secretary's job is to, is to find data about education and tell it to the president. That way the president can, you know, lead. It's impossible to know everything in this country, so having 
people that you trust that can help you and advise you on things is what the president needs. We call it a presidential cabinet. Every single president has one. And the cabinet has grown and gotten bigger and bigger with more and more advisors continually over the years. I think, don't quote me on this, I should probably look these things up before I say them, I think there are 16 members of the presidential cabinet as of 2015, but I could be wrong. Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton are both going to be appointed to the cabinet, and they are going to be heavily involved in George Washington's presidency and some of the major decisions that happen in the United States. One of the first things we have to establish is this thing called the Judiciary Act of 1789. A big problem with the Constitution is that it's pretty vague. And what I mean by that is that it says a bunch of things should happen, but it doesn't say how. For example, Article 3 of the Constitution doesn't – it says there should be a Supreme Court, but that's pretty much all it says. It says that we should have a court system, but it doesn't really explain what that's going to look like. The Judiciary Act of 1789 is going to establish the federal court system and have a Supreme Court as the final authority on laws and rules of the United States. Okay, let's talk about Alexander Hamilton. Um, <clears throat> I just... I just find these pictures of Hamilton hilarious. There's just something about seeing founding fathers posing like, you know, they're movie stars. Just makes me laugh. Now, the American economy is going to be in trouble. And in fact, this is kind of a constant theme you may have noticed, the American economy being in trouble. Um, well, that's the problem that you have when you establish a country on not paying taxes. Turns out, no matter what your parents say and how much all of us hate taxes, Taxes are necessary to run a country. You need them. You have to have taxes to establish an economy. We've kind of established a country on the fact that we don't like paying taxes. Well, no taxation without representation. Point is, um, we have a financial crisis on our hands. And in fact, this country almost collapses in on itself because we don't have any money. So we got to find a way to fix the economy. And Alexander Hamilton, a member of the president's cabinet, is going to give the president an idea on how to do it. So, <clears throat> Hamilton is going to be uh, what we call a loose constructionist. There are two ways to view the Constitution. There is what we call a strict constructionist and a loose constructionist. So, if you read your Constitution, and I know you guys all have, you've probably very carefully read Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 which essentially says that the government shall have whatever powers are necessary and proper to do its duties. Well, what does that mean? What does necessary and proper mean? Well, think of it this way. The Constitution says that there should be, like the mail should be delivered. The Constitution does say that it is the job of the federal government to deliver the mail, but it doesn't say how. It just says that it needs to be done, but not how. So if your interpretation of how that should be done determines if you are a strict or a loose constructionist. A loose constructionist would say, we need to build post offices all over the United States, and we're going to have people go to your house every single day and drop off the mail. Those people are going to be paid for by the U.S. government, and we're going to put stamps that... Um, you have to buy to be able to send letters. Does it say any of those words in the Constitution? No. But is that necessary to achieve the goal of having a postal service? Yes. That's a loose constructionist philosophy. A strict constructionist doesn't want to go too far from the Constitution. A strict constructionist would say, okay, well, we're going to deliver letters, but we're not going to deliver packages. Or um, they're basically going to try to be limited. The other word that we use for um, a loose, or sorry, for the necessary and proper clause is we call it the elastic clause. The reason why is because elastic can stretch. Now, why am I bringing all this up? Well, Hamilton is going to 
propose some changes to how this country runs that are going to be a very, very loose definition or a loose interpretation of the rules. It's not so much that Hamilton is breaking the rules. It's more along the fact that Hamilton's going to say, you know, we need to have an economy. The government needs to be involved with this. Here's how it should happen. Again, this is a very important concept. I want to make sure it's explicitly clear. The Necessary and Proper Clause basically says that the government has the power to do what it needs to do to enforce its own laws. Depending on how you view that statement, if you think the government should have a lot of power, you are a loose constructionist. Alexander Hamilton is a loose constructionist. If you think the government shouldn't step too far outside of the explicit rules in the Constitution, you are a strict constructionist. Those are the two differences. Okay. So now that we know that, let's look in and see what Hamilton wanted to do to fix the U.S. economy. His first plan is called the Report on Public Credit. Here's the main problem. The United States owes $75 million in war debt. And this is back in 1789 money, which I don't have a conversion off the top of my head. But let's just assume it's a lot of money. So here's his idea on how the U.S. government can raise that money. What if the U.S. government sells these things called war bonds to raise cash? A war bond essentially is um, you give the U.S. government 50 bucks and the U.S. government is going to give you back a piece of paper. What happens is you hold on to that piece of paper and you cash it in in a couple of years. Um, the government says, hey, thank you for supporting the, the United States. You bought this five years ago for 50 bucks. Now it's been five years. We've made some money. We're going to give you $55 for that piece of paper back. It's essentially, a bond is essentially a loan that the government takes from you. It's not a tax. It's voluntary. It's actually a pretty good investment opportunity, by the way. Um, but this is actually a really good way to uh, kind of get this country back together. The other assumption here is that the national government is going to assume all of the state debts. Guys, we are one country. It doesn't make sense if, um, I don't know, some states fought harder in the war and then they're going to have to pay a lot more money for our independence. It, it makes sense if we're all in this together. So now we're going to basically have the national government assume all of the state government debt and really rebuild a new future together. His other plan, along with this, is to use the, uh, the money from the sale of land out west to pay off our debts to Europe. So we're going to open up that land out west, you know, the whole um, proclamation of 1763. We're going to get rid of that. Hey, let's move out west. Let's sell that land to people. And then we'll take the money from that sale to pay off our debt. He also wants to raise taxes on imports and put something called an excise tax, which is a tax on things that you, not like a sales tax. tax. It's a tax on uh, sales between states. Don't worry, it'll never come up again. Um, but he wants to put a tax on whiskey. That's going to be a problem later. Hey, by the way, see this graph in the lower right? If you can understand it without somebody explaining it to you, congratulations, you are ready for AP Econ. If you don't understand it and it looks a little confusing, congratulations, you should start studying for AP Econ. His other plan, sorry, <clears throat> his other plan is going to be to establish a Bank of the United States. Um, the idea here is let's make a Bank of the United States that the United States can do its banking. A place that we can put all the tax revenue that we're getting as a country, a safe place um, for people to put their money. It's going to be guaranteed by the United States government. It's going to regulate the, the banking system, and it would be no, of no cost to taxpayers. This sounds like a great idea to establish a national bank, a bank of the United States. Not to be confused with the company that exists today called Bank of America. We are not talking about the company that exists today, the Bank of America. In fact, 
the Bank of America will never come up in this class. Never think about the company Bank of America ever again in this class. Whenever you hear the words Bank of the United States, this is not that company. The Bank of the United States implies that the U.S. government is going to run a bank, not a private company. I hope we're clear. So, there's one small, small problem with this brilliant, brilliant plan. It is nowhere in the Constitution. Does it say in the Constitution that the U.S. government can establish a national bank to store all of its money? No. Does it say in the Constitution that one of the jobs of the U.S. government is to promote, inter or to promote commerce and to regulate interstate commerce? Yes. So again, Hamilton is the best example of someone using the necessary and proper clause. He is going to interpret that clause to mean that if we need a bank to store all of our money, we can make it because that is, a, that is helping us do one of the rules written in the Constitution. By the way, if that line of thinking and that logic makes sense to you, you're going to be a really good lawyer one day. Congress approves this idea of a Bank of the United States, and George Washington's going to ask his cabinet for advice. Obviously, Alexander Hamilton's going to support this, um, but Thomas Jefferson doesn't. We're going to talk about Thomas Jefferson's different political philosophy uh, in a lot more detail in uh, Chapter 8. But for now, um, just know that Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton don't agree. Hamilton is a loose constructionist. He believes that you can kind of make laws as you need. Thomas Jefferson pretty much believes you can only go by the book. You can't add anything else to it. Well, Washington decides to agree with Hamilton, and we create a Bank of the United States. The American West and the American South hate the bank, as do most of the citizens. Um, so this is actually a very unpopular decision, but it may actually be necessary for the survival of the country, especially early on. Hey look, there is me holding a $10 bill with Alexander Hamilton's portrait on it at the Smithsonian Museum of, of uh, oh, what's it called? It's called the American Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. It is part of the Smithsonian Museum. You can go and see all these famous portraits. And there is me holding a $10 bill in front of Alexander Hamilton. Great times. Now, let's discuss that tax, that excise tax. Hamilton wanted to put a tax on whiskey. Um, it's going to raise revenue um, for a good that we don't want people to use. Um, we do this today. They're called sin taxes. A sin tax is a tax on an item we don't want people to use anymore. So for example, cigarettes. A pack of cigarettes costs like 20 cents for the tobacco companies to make. But if you try to buy a pack of cigarettes, it's like over $5 or something crazy like that. Why? We've added all of these taxes to it to make the product more expensive so people stop buying it. Turns out once something gets expensive, people stop buying it. Hamilton didn't like people that drank too much alcohol, so he wanted to put a tax on alcohol to get people to stop buying it. That is why he added this tax. There's going to be a problem though. You guys probably don't know how alcohol is made, and that's probably a good thing because you're too young to know. But you actually make alcohol from leftover grain and barley. That's what you can make alcohol from. It's the distilling process. It's kind of complicated, but it's basic chemistry. Um, what would happen, farmers, when they were done farming their crops, would take the leftover crops and turn it into whiskey for extra profits, especially in those long winters where they weren't making a lot of food anymore. That was the only way that farmers could make any money. Well, now the government has added some weird special tax just to whiskey that really, really hurt farmers. The farmers are going to be really upset about this. Um, farmers began to try to tar and feather tax collectors because that's just what we do when we don't like something. We don't like something, we go ahead and take the people that are making us pay taxes and beat them up. Well, 
George Washington isn't going to have any of that. Once he hears about this whiskey rebellion, about a bunch of farmers beating up tax collectors, Washington gets on his horse, calls in 13,000 militiamen, and rides to where these riots are taking place and says, okay, that's enough. Washington's pretty hardcore. This showed us something. The reason why we discussed the Whiskey Rebellion is the fact that previously in this class, for the first couple of chapters, when we want to change something, America has kind of a violent protest. And the king or the early parliament is not capable of solving these violent protests. What the Whiskey, whiskey Rebellion does is it shows that violent protest is no longer okay in this country. George Washington put this protest down. It is over. Violent protest is no longer okay in this country, and it's going to be stopped. It also shows that this government has significantly more power than earlier governments and needs to be taken seriously. Oh boy, the French. Oh, I hate talking about them. So let's discuss the French as briefly as possible. Mr. Boy, this, this is a uh, U.S. history class. What do we care about France? And that is the right attitude to have. We don't care about France. But, unfortunately, even though we're the United States, even though we're the greatest country in the world, things that happen in other countries actually affect us. I know that's weird and scary and a hard concept for many Americans to contemplate and understand, but it's true. Things that happen in other countries actually affect us. So we need to be aware of what happens in other places. Well, the French realized that we had a great idea. The United States had a great idea, overthrowing a monarchy that the people feel doesn't uh, represent them anymore. Let's overthrow that monarchy. And in 1789, as you guys probably remember from world history last year, the French go through a big crazy revolution. People die, heads get chopped off. It's a great time for everyone. Um, lots of parties. Well, the U.S. or sorry, the French are going to look at the U.S. and go, um, <clears throat> "Hey guys, remember when we helped you overthrow the British? You mind uh, giving us a little help here in this uh, revolution? You know, you mind repaying the favor?" The United States is going to respond with something that's going to seem a little strange to you guys because. We have the exact opposite philosophy today. Usually, we get involved in another country's business before they even ask us for help or even know we're there. Whenever there's a crisis somewhere overseas, the United States is the first country to respond. That's just what we do. That's who we are. We are very involved in other people's business, much like your parents if they are listening to this audio lecture while you are listening to it. Um, <laughs> hi, parents. Um, but... During this time period, and really for the first half of U.S. history, it's the exact opposite. The United States does not want to get involved in anyone else's problems. We want to focus on ourselves. We are not going to get involved in other people's affairs. Okay? In fact, we even pass a law that says that. It's called the Proclamation of American Neutrality. France goes, hey, America, can you pay back the favor? And America goes... What favor? We did that all by ourselves. Leave us alone. We tell the French we are not going to get involved. Now, the French Revolution expands and it starts to become almost like a mini world war with a whole bunch of other problems going down in France. And we basically tell the rest of the world, we are out. Do not bug us. Don't get us involved. But um, <clears throat> even though we're out, we'll still trade with you. We still want your money. We're just not going to help you in your war. Well, that's not going to go over all that well. King George III wants to make sure the United States stays out of the fight. Again, this French Revolution has essentially become a world war in Europe. Um, so what he's going to start doing is he's going to say any American ship that is, over, that is in European waters can be captured by the English. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now we have our vessels overseas being taken over. And worse than that, if a American ship is conquered by a British ship or by the British government, they are going to take these sailors off of that ship and put them in the British military. 
So if an American is sailing overseas and gets captured by someone else, that American is going to be forced to fight for another army. We call that impressment, or impressed in this case. An American sailor can be impressed and forced to join a foreign country's military. Well, that's bad. That's obviously not good. We can't let American citizens uh, be threatened by foreign countries, can we? Well... We're not really happy about it, but we're also not really strong enough to do anything about it. So, what does the United States do to try to stop Americans being captured and being forced to fight for a foreign country? Well, we send some dudes over to Europe to discuss a treaty with the European powers, specifically in this case Great Britain. John Jay, who happens to be a Supreme Court Justice, is going to be sent to Great Britain to negotiate a treaty. Essentially, he gets the British to stop, like, pestering us, but the treaty that he signs, Jay's treaty, actually doesn't stop impressment. He comes home and goes, okay, uh, we solved the problem, except for the fact that he didn't solve anything, and the American citizens are excuse my French, pissed. They are so mad that we sent someone over there to deal with this problem and then it doesn't get dealt with. Americans still have this fear of sailing overseas because they might be captured by another government and our government's not going to help. Oh boy. On top of that, uh, another treaty is going to be established during this time period. It's called Piccanese Treaty. You might know it as the Treaty of San Lorenzo. We basically established a treaty with Spain saying, look, we don't want to fight you especially considering the fact that Spain controls what is now the American Southwest and Florida. We basically say, hey, Spain, look, man, we don't want to fight. I know everyone else is fighting. Europe and Great Britain are, are fighting, and Britain and France are fighting. We don't want to get involved. Spain, we cool? And Spain's like, yeah, we cool. True story. All right, great. Let's move on. You know... For a chapter about George Washington, we really haven't talked about him much at all. So let's talk about him really quickly. Now, George Washington is revered almost like, I don't want to say like a god, but you know, kind of like a god in this country. Um, we kind of see him as our founding father. Like he is the dude. You don't challenge Washington. You don't. In fact, you could be openly mocked and ridiculed if you said anything bad about the President of the United States, especially a president as popular and successful as George Washington. This dude is the guy. He is America. You talk bad on him, you're talking bad on America. No matter how bad of a job Washington does, you can't say anything bad about him because you're speaking about this man. Washington, however, is going to make a critical mistake. Let's talk about what that mistake is. Washington's not a perfect president. In fact, I wouldn't put him in my top 10, which is saying something, I know. He's not the greatest president of all time, and there's gonna be a couple of mistakes that happen during his presidency. People are afraid to criticize George Washington, but George Washington does something that ends up being a critical mistake. What does he do? George Washington announces that he is part of the Federalist Party. In fact, he comes out and says, I consider myself to be a Federalist. What's the big deal, Mullen? Who cares? He says he's a Federalist. Big deal. Well, think about what that means. That means that if you want to criticize George Washington, you don't need to say that George Washington made a mistake. You can instead say that the Federalists made a mistake. Now, I'm not attacking George Washington. I'm not anti-American for attacking George Washington. Instead, I'm attacking a political party that he happens to represent. That seems like a kind of a petty distinction, but it actually is a very important distinction. And if you really listen to politics and listen to what uh, politicians say, they say that a lot. Oh, the Democrats think this. The Republicans think that. They're not necessarily always attacking an individual, but they're attacking a political philosophy. George Washington came out and said that he represents the Federalist political philosophy, and almost immediately after he says that, all of these people that have been secretly 
disagreeing with Washington can finally now step out and start attacking him because they can attack the party he represents. So the one political group we've had for this entire chapter has been the Federalists because they support the Constitution. Well, now a new political party is going to form. This new political party is going to be known as the Republican Party. And just to make your life confusing, this is not the same Republican Party that exists in the United States in the year 2015. I know. In fact, to make it even more confusing, we should really call it the Jeffersonian Republican Party. And to make it even triply confusing, Jefferson called it the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans just to mess with your mind. I know. Just know that a different political party existed. They called themselves the Republicans. I will go over political parties with you and explain how this all works later. Don't stress out. Just know that there is a dissenting opinion from George Washington now. What does a Republican of this time period believe? Well, Federalists are going to typically be loose constructionists. We need a stronger, bigger, more powerful federal government. And a Republican during this time period is going to believe the opposite. We need to have a more strict view of the Constitution. We have to stick to what the Constitution says. We can't make this government too big. You can see that there's a uh, kind of a connection to the United States today with our political philosophies. It's true. It exists. Well, the Republican Party starts attacking the Federalist Party and starting to criticize the decisions that George Washington has made. In 1796, George Washington has been president for eight years, and he realizes that he's getting old, he's actually really sick, and this is not worth the stress anymore. So Washington decides, you know what, I'm not going to go for three terms, I'm going to stop after eight years, and I'm going to go ahead and call it a day. I had a good run, or well, for Washington, you know, one leg was longer than the other, so it was more like a hobble. Anyway, um... <laughs> Washington gives a farewell address to this country, and it's funny that we call it a farewell address because it's not actually a speech. He basically writes a letter to Congress, and in this letter he says something. Get ready to put a star next to this. There are two very important things that he says. Number one, he tells Americans to stay out of European politics. The Europeans are constantly going to war expensive wars, dangerous wars, the United States will crumble if we get involved in foreign problems. Let's just focus on ourselves. That's number one. The second thing he says is that political parties will ruin America. He tells Americans to not have political parties because political parties will destroy this country. Why? How do political parties destroy this country? It's causing political divisiveness, and that is not good for the American fabric, especially when we are a young country at this time period. So again, farewell address. Two things. One, stay out of Europe. Two, no political parties. We only kind of half listen to this, and um, eh, it's going to cause problems later on. But there you go. Whatever happened to George Washington, you say? Well, he died of a sore throat. How bad were doctors at this time period that the President of the United States, the first President of the United States, ultimately dies because of a sore throat? Hmm. Tragic. Let's move on to what happens now that Washington's gone. He is done from our story. In fact, I'll probably never mention him directly again, it's set for discussing the farewell address. So we're going to have another election. Time for the first real election of the United States. I know what you're saying. Wait a minute. George Washington won two. Okay, fine. But really, this is the first actual election in the United States. It is John Adams versus Thomas Jefferson in a all-out, no-holds-barred, steel cage match for the presidency. Jefferson should be the obvious winner because he is taller. And as, as steel cage matches will tell you, the taller wrestler usually wins. Oh, but John Adams, he's crafty. And he's also, you know, might not be as brilliant as Jefferson, but John Adams is no slouch. 
Plus, John Adams, as, a, as an actual farmer, and did all the farming himself, didn't have slaves do it like Jefferson. So Adams is actually pretty buff. Anyway, um, <laughs> this election is actually momentous in U.S. history, mainly because um, George Washington stepped down. Holy cow. In fact, King George III said that if George Washington steps down, it'll be the most important political thing to ever happen in the world. And George Washington did step down. And we're going to have a new leader of this country with absolutely no violence. It's pretty impressive when you think about it. Um, the Federalist Party are going to support this dude named John Adams. He happens to be one of my favorite uh, American founding fathers. And the, uh, the other political party, the Republicans, are going to select a dude named Thomas Jefferson. As you can see in this chart, the North tends to vote for Adams and the South tends to vote for Jefferson. But you have to remember, there are more people living in the North than there are in the South. So the North is going to get a little bit more of a sway. It's a very close election, but John Adams becomes the second president of the United States. Adams, unfortunately, is not a very successful president of this country, mainly because <clears throat> Adams is kind of arrogant and a little harsh. So people tend to not like that in their leaders. They don't like leaders saying, look, I could explain this to you, but you're not smart enough anyway, so let's just forget it. That's the kind of thing Adams would say. Um, when it turns out Americans don't like being told they're dumb. Who'd have thought? Let's discuss some events during Adams' tumultuous presidency. Ugh, the French again. So look, remember how we discussed, you know, several years ago in this class, I should say, um, the French had their revolution in 1789, and here we are seven years later, and there are still there is still a lot of fighting going on in um, in France. There is problems all over Europe. Europe still embodied in a bunch of civil wars. It is a big giant zoo in Europe. Well, to make matters worse, the French start taking over American ships as well. They start impressing American sailors. Oh, geez. Now we have the British taking our sailors and the French taking our sailors. In fact, it's getting so bad that the United States is actually kind of afraid a war might break out with France. And we don't want to fight a war. We are not ready. So Adams, trying to avoid a war with France, is going to send some diplomats to France to negotiate a treaty. When they get there, there are th three American men go. When the three American men get there, um, they uh, the first person they meet is this dude named Charles de Talleyrand. Don't worry, you'll never see his name again, but he's just part of the story. So Charles de Talleyrand says, hey, look, if you want to meet with the leadership here in France, you got to pay France a $250,000 bribe. Like, it's a fee just to talk to our government. I'm not going to guarantee you'll even get a treaty, but... Um, you got to pay $250,000 to even get in the door to talk to the leadership. Well, the Americans are like, uh, we are not authorized to give you $250,000 just for the chance to talk about a peace settlement. So the Americans leave. They come back home to the United States. They tell the report of their story. And the American public is like, oh, that's it. We are done with the French. We got to just blow that place up from space. Let's launch something to space and just level France. The American public is adamant about a war. This is seen as an insult. In fact, it's such an insult that we call it the XYZ affair. Americans were enraged, and there was a really popular chant during this time period that says, we Americans will spend millions of dollars for our defense, but we will not pay one cent in tribute to another country. We're not going to pay a bribe, but you know what? We'd rather spend millions of dollars protecting ourselves and fighting a war than paying a bribe. Sound familiar? If not, it will by the end of the year. The country begins to prepare for war, even though John Adams knows that this is a really bad idea. Going to war could destroy the United States. He does not want to go and fight, even though the American public does. Adams ultimately avoids this war with France. He's going to negotiate a treaty, he's going to negotiate a peace at the last minute, and he is going to basically stop the impressments for a little while, and 
make it so that the United States and France don't go to war. It's actually one of the biggest political achievements of the time period. It's a huge deal, but unfortunately, the American public was desperate for a war, and John Adams would not give it to them. The American public never really forgives him, which is part of the reason why Adams loses the election in 1800. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we talk about that election, let's discuss some other things that are going to happen because of this potential war with France. So, this is another one of those things that um, comes up a lot in U.S. history. Whenever we're about to go to war, we basically get really, really nervous about anyone talking any trash on the United States. We're going to do a big long, uh, I shouldn't make it seem bad, we're going to do a big discussion of these documents. We're going to read them in more detail to go over what they mean. So I'm going to be a little brief going over them in this capacity because we're going to spend a couple of days in class um, going over this. So I'll be a little brief right now. Essentially what happened here though is that a war is about to break out with France. And in the United States, we are basically really nervous about anyone saying anything bad about the United States when a war is about to break out. Um, you guys, fortunately, are probably no longer at the age where you remember what 9-11 was like in the United States. So the patriotic fervor that happened after 9-11 is probably foreign to you. But ask your parents what this country was like after 9-11 and they will tell you that the country was super hardcore patriotic and Anyone that even remotely looked, talked, or acted like a Muslim terrorist was ostracized in this country. So, when we're about to go to war with France during this time period, that's essentially how the United States is going to see anyone that is a foreigner. There's one small problem, though. This country is pretty young, and almost everyone is a foreigner. So, you can see why this might be an issue. As this war is about to break out, the Federalists in Congress are going to pass something called the Alien and Sedition Acts. Whenever you see the word sedition, it basically means bad talk against the government. And when you see the word alien, it doesn't mean a green person from outer space. It means a non-citizen. So, the Alien and Sedition Acts are basically a laws designed to hurt non-citizens um, from talking bad about our government. Let's go through all four of them in detail. Number one basically says, the Alien Enemies Act basically says, if you are a spy, you will be deported. Simple as that. The Alien Friends Act basically says, the president can kick out any foreign resident whose activities were deemed as dangerous. And again, we're going to read this and break it apart in more detail. The Naturalization Act increase the residency requirement to gain citizenship. Basically it meant that it was even it took even longer to become a citizen of this country than it normally did. And then finally the big one is the Sedition Act. This basically says that um, if you say anything bad about the US government you could be thrown in jail. You could not speak, write, say, it, or even imply anything bad about the president uh, his policies or the actions of Congress. Holy cow, you can't say anything bad about the government? That's a pretty serious law. And if you want to be a conspiracy theorist, this law was set to expire on March 3rd, 1801, which would have been the very last day of John Adams' presidency and would have been the first day of the new president. Many people argue that the Alien and Sedition Acts have nothing to do with France, and that these were really passed to make it so that way the Federalist Party could not defend themselves in the election. But you'd have to be a pretty big conspiracy theorist to agree with that. That's probably exactly why they exist. Um, moving on. The Republican Party, the group that's dissenting against the Federalists this entire time, are not going to be happy about this. They are not going to be happy with these laws because these laws basically imply that the Republican Party cannot disagree with the actions of the Federalists. It basically takes away the Republican Party's right to free speech. 
which, you know, is a violation of everything this country stands for. So the Republican Party is going to be very upset about this. So upset, in fact, that they create a new theory called the Compact Theory. Put a star next to this, it comes up a lot. Here's the idea. The Compact Theory states that the U.S. government, this union of states, only exists because of an agreement between the states to allow the federal government to exist. The U.S. government only exists because the states made an agreement creating it. If the federal government does something to hurt a state or the citizens of a state, the state can nullify or get rid of that law. So the compact theory says that the U.S. government only has power, excuse me, because the states say it does. If the federal government passes a law that the states do not like, the states can nullify or get rid of that law or perhaps nullify the entire agreement and break apart the United States. The reason why this might sound important is because you probably heard of something called the Civil War. And a big reason why the Civil War happens is over this idea that if a state doesn't like something the federal government does, it can just decide not to do it. This is the states telling the federal government, we are more powerful than you. Spoiler alert, they're not. That's why we fight a civil war. That's what the civil war proves. Again, the Republican Party is really upset that they're losing their right to free speech. So they argue this idea called the Compact Theory, which says the Alien and Sedition Acts are so bad, and this law is so heinous that these states, Virginia and Kentucky, are not going to enforce them. In fact, we're going to nullify them and say, those laws don't exist here. I don't care if the federal government made this law. In Virginia and Kentucky, that law doesn't exist. It's called the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. And they argue the compact theory. But they basically say, hey, John Adams, hey, Federalist, we're not going to enforce your law. We don't like it. It's bogus and it's wrong. And do something about it if you're going to do something. Well, unfortunately for the story, because, you know, the Civil War almost got fought, like, you know, that day. Unfortunately for the story, um, Adams is going to work out an agreement and the French and the Americans aren't going to go to war and the Alien and Sedition Acts aren't really going to be enforced and the uh, big blow up between the states and the federal government kind of fizzles away for now. For now, everything's kind of fizzled away. Adams is going to run for re-election. We'll talk about that election in the next chapter. But he's not going to be too popular of a guy anymore. People are going to think that he was trying to, like, you know, lie to the American public. And the Republican Party is going to say, hey, look at what your government's trying to do. They're trying to stop us from making this country better for you. Things are going to get a little um, contentious in the United States during this time period. Now... That's where the major information in this chapter stops, but there's going to be a couple of more things that the chapter also discusses that I'm going to mention on the next couple of slides. Are they drastically important for the AP exam? No. Will uh, it help you formulate be a better understanding of this time period so you can write better essays? Yes. So let's look at a couple of these things and look at what the 1790s in America looked like from the cultural and social perspective now that we looked at the political and economic perspective. Slowly, and I mean very slowly, but surely things are starting to change in America. Most Americans at this time period are farmers, but with improvements in technology, we basically make it so that way not every single person has to farm. In fact, shockingly enough, we actually have essentially made it where one person can do enough farming for 50 which means that those other 49 people don't have to be farmers, which means they can start making more products. What we start to see in the 1790s is a 
gradual shift from every American farming to fewer and fewer Americans farming for their own food. And it's going to be a, a slow process, but eventually it gets to a point where I'm going to go ahead and guess not a single person watching this video has grown their own food or at least grown every component for a meal. Maybe you've grown, you know, some, uh, some like, you know, spices in your backyard or, you know, tomatoes. Everyone's grown those. But you probably haven't made your own food um, from seeds. That's how drastically America's changed. And it starts to really start happening in the 1790s. But again, this is going to be a common theme that I'll keep briefly mentioning, how we are slowly but surely going from a nation of entirely farmers to a nation of not anyone really farming anymore. Let's talk about the ladies. Um, ladies, one big problem. Constitution doesn't mention you. Declaration of Independence doesn't use the uh, any implication of women in it at all. It says all men are created equal, doesn't even imply that women exist in this country, and women aren't necessarily seen as citizens of this country. Sorry, ladies. Um, that's kind of be a... Uh, Kind of a long, long uh, process for you. However, ladies, you are important. We're going to start seeing this idea called Republican motherhood. I'll mention it again, but I'll tell you what it is now. It basically says that a woman's, a woman's role in the house is extremely important because women raise the next generation of Americans. It is, the, it is an important role of women to instill a love of America and to instill American values into their children. So basically, it's the duty of a mother to make children patriotic. Let's talk about Native Americans. Um, the Native Americans are going to suffer severe losses of land. In the American Revolutionary War, the Native Americans side on the wrong side. They side with the British, we beat the British, which means we beat the Natives, which means all that land that is west of the Appalachian Mountains is now open for the taking. We start taking land away from the Native Americans. Now, we do want to save some Native American land because we don't want to have the Native Americans constantly fighting us. That's not going to do us any good. So while we take away most of their land to appease the Natives, we actually sign something called the Indian Trade and Intercourse Acts, which basically imply that we're going to set aside some land for the Natives and then we're going to take all the rest. Again, this is done to appease the Natives. That way they don't keep constantly fighting us. But we're going to basically violate these intercourse acts over and over and over. We're going to basically go back on our word over and over and over because for Americans, the quest for more land is always more important than any agreement we make with anyone. Um, there's going to be something called the Battle of the Fallen Timbers, which is the last major battle in the Ohio Valley. Basically, after this, the Native Americans don't fight us in the Ohio Valley, and we don't have any more major Native American insurrections east of the Mississippi River. I'm not sure why that specific battle is so important, but the College Board says it is, so I'm going to mention it, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Last slide. Let's talk about the status of black Americans. Slowly, and I mean very slowly, but surely, we're starting to see a couple of Americans start to notice that it doesn't make sense for us to say that all men are created equal while we have slavery. And there's going to be a very slow but firm push to go away from slavery in the United States. In fact, um, by the year 1800, 11% of all black blacks in America are going to be free, and those are mainly in the North. So the North is starting to move away from slavery, which they never really had in the first place. It wasn't practical for the Northern economy, but the North is going away from slavery, and the South is going to become more dependent on it. Um, the slave problem is actually going to be postponed by Congress. There's actually an addition to the Constitution that says that the slave trade needs to end by the year 1807, not that slavery needs to end. Basically, 
when the Constitution was written, they said, okay, let's just kick this down the road 20 years from now, and hopefully this problem will have solved itself by then. And of course, as you know, the slavery problem was solved by 1807, and slavery never came up again in U.S. history. Oh, right. It's the, the exact opposite. So um, the slavery issue is essentially going to be continually postponed in this country. But we want to make sure one thing is clear. We don't want slaves to run away. The slaves that exist where slavery is need to stay there. We passed this thing called the Fugitive Slave Law, which says that if a slave master comes up to a judge and says, hey man, my slave ran away, they can get that slave back. And the slave, who by the way is not a citizen of this country, has no legal rights. And on that happy note, we are going to end this chapter. Uh, I will see you guys all again in chapter 8.